So to introduce us, my name is Lars Hermann. I'm responsible for integrated solutions at Red Hat. I've been with Red Hat for many, many years. I've been, had the opportunity to do many, many interesting things. Now it's about putting all our products and technologies together to build solutions that solve real world problems. And one of these real world problems that we face and we talk a lot about is security. I brought Daniel with me. Yeah, Daniel Rieck, I run the cross product integration engineering team. Work closely with Lars, been at Red Hat forever. Took a break, came back. Uh, been in Linux, suffered through the non-enterprise history and to enterprise. And uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit about where we want to take Linux in the security context and how to solve challenges of the future based on the experience we have. So as you've noticed by now, we're both from Germany and we have a tendency arguing with each other. So we will practice that skill today. Yeah. <laughs> the topic, as you can see, is containers and security. And of course, there's a lot of chatter out in the market about are containers secure? What do we have to do to make secure, uh, containers secure? And there's a lot of confusion about container scanning and do we need virtual machines to make containers secure? We want to provide today a perspective that's, holistically, that's holistic and actually speaks to a slightly different topic. We don't want to talk so much about how do we make containers secure. We want to talk about how do we use containers to make the enterprise secure because that's what we believe the opportunity is. In order to do this, we want to walk through a little bit, why are we talking so much about containers? What's really the value of containers in the enterprise? And then also talk about how, does, how do these values and how do these trends change how we have to think about security? As we will see, we use an analogy, traditional strategies and traditional measures and approaches are no longer working as well as they used to, if they ever have. And then we'll go into a more technical discussion to talk about how containers really fit into these pictures and how we use the technologies to drive more security in the enterprise. Um, hopefully, towards the end of the session, we'll have time for answering any questions. And given that it's the last session, we might even uh, be able to answer them afterwards. So let's get started. Why containers? We've heard about this a lot in the last few days. It's really about IT is changing. The role of IT is changing. And it's changing from being a group or a function inside an organization that supports the business to increasingly becoming the business. More and more value to customers is delivered through software in the form of mobile applications, in the form of automated business processes, in the form of digital transactions uh, that happen in, in, all this, in all, lots of systems. And as a result, industries get transformed. Uh, we have never seen as much pressure uh, across all industries not only from technology accelerating the pace of innovation and creating opportunity and threat, but also companies entering industries that within that given industry nobody had on the radar. And uh, from an enterprise perspective, IT needs to evolve. IT needs to become a center of competency inside the organization to drive that digital transformation. And in order to do this, we believe everybody has to become a software company. Now, most organizations are not great software companies today. So we see our role as Red Hat helping organizations getting there. What does that mean in the practical terms? Until a few years ago, not too long ago, the key success for a CIO was about keep systems up and running and make it cheaper, save money. This was the role of the CIO. And that has dramatically changed. Now we talk about the CIO being measured on how much value, how much innovation can we drive out to the business? And we measure this in how much satisfaction do we create with our customers? How much business opportunity do we create? At the same time, though, there's another success metric, which is about agility. The organization as a whole needs to become more agile. In a world of digital competition, it's not good enough to update systems or applications every three months or once per month because by that time has passed as your competitors have driven a lot more improvements and maybe stolen users or stolen value from you. And while we focus very much on customer satisfaction and agility, a lot of talk is about this, uh, and we'll hear more about this later, there's also the element of confidence to deliver. We still have to deliver traditional things like availability, security, as we'll see. Now, let's dive into agility for a second. Agility, for the most part, is not a technology problem. Inside an organization, agility is largely defined by wait time between different teams. CIOs tell us that on average it takes eight weeks in an enterprise IT organization to provide virtual machines to a development team, to a project team that wants to start something. 
we know, I hope everybody in this room knows, that that's not a matter of technology. It doesn't take eight weeks to spin up a VM. That's a matter of seconds or minutes. It is about the complexity of an organization where in order to get this virtual environment, we have to request work from lots of different teams and groups inside the organization, and it takes them time to be able to do that work. And that is a reality. And we've actually seen that even organizations who have embraced and adopted cloud technologies, like there was a keynote at the OpenStack Summit two months ago in Austin, Texas, where there was actually an example showing how the introduction of private cloud reduced the wait time from 38 days to 34 days. <laughs> because they didn't change the organization and the processes, how they work. So in order to deliver the agility in an enterprise, we have to eliminate wait time. It's as simple as that. Now, if we look into the customer satisfaction, how do we deliver customer satisfaction using software and technology-based systems? It comes down to, and there's lots of things to it. But if we think about it, obviously, there's an element of performance, right? We want systems to be performed. We want results fast. We don't want to wait on anything as consumers as much as producers. But features are very important. We want to race to deliver more capabilities and uh, target more users, serve more users, and uh, deliver more value. And Increasingly, the value is not so much defined by functional attributes. We all know this. I think we all have to deal in parts of our lives with ugly user interfaces and unintuitive processes and tools, and that is just no longer accepted. And if you look at all these three things, they have one thing in common, performance, experience, and features. We need a very high pace of change in order to deliver them, in order to improve and enhance them on an ongoing basis. So we're back to the agility. Agility and customer satisfaction go hand in hand. Now, looking at the infrastructure, all these applications run an infrastructure, and if we take what we just heard and bring it into a more generic view, what does the infrastructure have to deliver? And we see a number of patterns here emerge that uh, speak to these benefits. We, need, we want to be agile and responsive, how do we enable that? We enable it by having comprehensive self-service and a high degree of automation. So we have, don't have to wait for humans. We just let the machine do the work for us. But we also need the ability to be streamlined and abstracted. We want the same thing available in different environments. We want to have portability across different environments. How do we achieve that? We abstract. We introduce layers of abstractions in the stack. And ideally, we introduce these layers in a way that we can build organization and process around so we eliminate wait time, right? And then a lot of these applications, we want to scale them up and down with workload, or we want to scale them up and down with where they are on their maturity curve. High pace of change early on, slowing down as they mature, and maybe go into some sort of maintenance mode. That is still the cycle that cloud-native applications go through as much as the traditional world. And in order to achieve that elasticity, we build on the capabilities up top, but we also want to share we want to share resources in order to have elasticity. And we want to combine all these things to get eventually to a utility-like infrastructure that is just silently invisible underneath our work, has a high degree of automation. And in order to do this, we have to let the machine make changes, make decisions, and be there for us when we need it. And that we implement using policy-driven automation and a high degree of resiliency. So these are abstract concepts. Now, how do we implement that in the real world? And this is where the megatrends come to the rescue. And we talk about this as an industry for many years. We talk about cloud giving us self-service and some level of abstraction and, uh, and automation. We talk about DevOps being the advancement in process that not only implements collaboration between developers in an ops side, but also is all about driving a high degree of automation and accelerating the pace of change. So cloud and DevOps go hand in hand and now we also talk about microservices, the ability to decompose applications into smaller units that we can manage and change at their own pace, while at the same time reducing the surface and reducing the complexity, and therefore reducing the complexity inside the organization. Now, how do we do all this? How do we do cloud? How can we bring this into the enterprise? How do we do DevOps? How do we do microservices? And there is one answer that has emerged, and that answer is containers. Because containers very nicely allows us to implement cloud paradigms and cloud values. It allows us to actually deliver microservices in a very practical way and operate them. And it also lends itself very well to a set of DevOps processes and values. That's what we're here today. We want to explore how we manage security in a DevOps style using containers running on cloud. 
What do containers deliver? Why are containers so important? Containers is obviously a complex technology problem. We'll talk a little bit more about it. We already have talked about quite a bit uh, in the last two days. But if we summarize it, containerization introduces, on one hand, a separation of responsibility, which allows us to enable autonomy in the organization. Somebody can own what goes into the container. Somebody else can own on where the container runs. And they both can optimize for their respective goals. We've been talking about this for years now. If you take that to the next step, containerization also standardizes how you deploy and manage applications, and that leads to radically better efficiency. It also, because we can automate against that standardization, leads to higher quality outcomes. We can anticipate that less mistakes get made. We have less issues to worry about. And best of all, because we abstract and we delegate responsibilities, we can specialize inside the organization against a new set of values and allow these people to make better choices and drive innovation and improvements on their own pace. That's why we talk about containers at a high level, and we'll look uh, into more detail. But at the core of all is the confidence to deliver. And what, what do we mean with this? What do we need to be confident that our service works so that we can go to bed at night and not have to expect that the phone rings because something went down and now we have to look into this? There's obviously the availability question. How can we make systems available? And that's a matter of resiliency, but also scale. There is the element of performance and elasticity. I already touched on this. And of course, we're using these distributed technologies that are available to us right now at the level of cloud, at the level of containers. Uh, and we'll talk more about this. And eventually, it's about scale. Small scale to large scale should be managed consistently. But what's in the center of that? It's security. Security is at the core of everything. And we have to recognize that security and the way we thought about it in IT until now needs to be rethought. And we believe this is not just a technology change. We have to rethink the strategies that we apply to manage security. So let's dive into this. First and foremost, when we asked our customers a few months ago uh, in a survey in January, what are your top priorities for this year and for next year, we found an interesting phenomenon. Security shows on both sides of this question. It is one of the top priorities in what are your initiatives? What's important for you? What do you want to improve? Security is number three, as you can see here, as uh, projects that are underway. And at the same time, it also shows as number two as what are your challenges? What is hard? What are you struggling with? Where are you looking for help? And where are you therefore putting your resources? So security definitely is at the center of attention. Maybe not the number one, but closely followed. And why is that? Here's why. IT used to be keep my name out of the press. And of course, with the digital business, not quite true anymore. We want to be in the press by delivering great digital services to customers and creating new opportunity. But if we look at the security domain, we still want to be out of the press. And we look at this as just three examples about breaches. I'm not going to go into any detail here. But what they all have in common is because of issues in managing the security of an environment, not only was actual real damage done, like in this case or in these cases, customer data, personal data being exposed to what shouldn't have been exposed. But picture the real damage is the fact that these logos are on the slide. There is reputational damage to these organizations. And if you compete with other companies in a digital business, the last thing you want is your customer or your user worrying about, can I trust these guys with my data, with my money, with my goods? So security is very important for that exact reason. So how do we do that? We also see inside the organization, security is one of the key reasons why we have been talking about this disconnect between application developers and the ops side. Paul actually talked about this this morning in his keynote. Um, and uh, we find that very often we've actually seen DevOps projects where organizations got very far. They automated what they did. They built pipelines. They built CI testing. But then when they wanted to go in production with what came out of these pipelines, Somebody need to manually look at this and approve it. And then the whole idea of automation was basically out of the window because now they were back to, I have to wait for somebody, I have to follow some rules that I cannot automate, and therefore the agility couldn't be accomplished. So that disconnect is in parts driven because these teams carry different values, but that's changing. But security really is in the way. And what we want to talk about today is how can we use technology to eliminate security being in the way between these two teams. So security is about managing risk. Right? We heard about that. Um, at the end, 
the outcomes we are trying to achieve is um, our integrity of service data and rules, privacy and accountability, and very important, regulatory compliance, right? Because if you're not compliant, people might go to jail over this, over the outcome. Very important. And in order to achieve that, you know, as Lars explained, it's not just a technology problem. We need to change the mindset, we need to change the culture, we need to change the process, and then we need some technologies that can support that. So we have to cover it end to end, otherwise there won't be security. And to you know, try to put that in a broader framework, this is the, the NIST cybersecurity framework that's trying to give us uh, guidance on a more modern approach to doing this. The key points are that you need to know what your code is. You need to identify your, your assets, otherwise you cannot secure them. If you don't know what you're running, you don't know what your threats are, you can't protect it. Next point, protection. Protection means that you have measures in place to actively protect, protect your codes. This has to be the structures, the architecture, and uh, specific tools that help you with this. Um, you need to detect attacks, right? If you don't know that there is an issue, if you don't know that there is an attack, then it doesn't help you that you can protect against it. You need to be able to respond when you protect. So you have to have active response capabilities, and then you need to be able to recover. And this is an ongoing cycle, so security is never done. You never have a secure system because security is a process, a cycle that needs to be uh, continuous. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense to us, doesn't it? And at the same time, it also looks very familiar. I don't think it looks fundamentally different from how we have thought about security five or ten years ago. But here's the catch. The reason why we have to think about it differently is we have seen multiple orders of magnitude increases in the complexity. And let me walk you through this chart which I produced myself, which is why it looks so great. <laughs> Thank you. Many years ago, we had relatively simple systems, like whatever mainframe with multi-users. I'm too young to remember that, but some of you might. We went to a client-server world. He in didn't which we, say that. He didn't say that. In which we strike. faced a lot of complexity, <laughs> because suddenly every application was broken down into multiple pieces running in different places. And now, for the first time, we actually introduced networking as a necessity in between. And we all know that networking is obviously a key source of security issues. We took this to the next level with the internet, the web, where now everything was not only networked, but it was actually connected to the world, uh, which dramatically changed how we thought about security. But we've not stopped there. We've introduced virtualization, which now introduced volatility into these systems. Systems were no longer static. They were software defined. And we have a much shorter lifetime of instances. So not only do we increase the numbers of things that can be insecure or need to communicate with other things in a secure way, the lifetime also changes. So the fact that we know that yesterday we had a problem might not matter anything because the system looks completely different. And consequently, because that was not enough, we went to cloud, where now we add self-service. So now we let ordinary users lose onto these technologies. So we increase complexity, not only in the number of subjects that we want to keep secure, now we actually expose lots and lots of people over which we have very little control in many cases. And we don't stop there either. Now we talk about microservices, which is about taking these same applications, running in these dynamic distributed architectures, and breaking them into lots of smaller pieces. So we can see how the complexity has dramatically increased. And therefore, we can assume that some of the best practices that we have been using might no longer be working as well. In order to explain that, we decided to come up with a simple analogy so we can actually be done here in time and we can still get our point across. So let's look at an example. A couple of years ago in cloud, we talked about pets versus cattle, and I personally never liked it very much because the idea of shooting something in the head sounded wrong to me. <laughs> but there is an interesting... I think you use this air pressure thing, right? That... No. <laughs> so we thought maybe we can use an analogy that's as powerful but not as brutal, and we came up with this. So let's pretend these are our applications in a very traditional sense. We have a few of them. We know what they're doing. If we think about security, then the first thing we have to think about is where are they? Are they doing fine? On a regular basis, we're going to feed them. We give them some commodities like water and food. And eventually, we get the value out of them, right? So this is a funny world. Everybody's happy. No threats. So is there anything we would have to worry about, Daniel? Mm, I don't know. It's, it's, they're happy. 
It's nice. So, oh, we've learned that sometimes we do have to worry about something. So there are yeah. bad people out there. What do we do? Well, I think a fence would be great, or a wall. You know, something to kind of keep the attacker out. You know, a barrier. All right, barrier. let's do that. Okay, so we limit access and we keep the bad guys out. Right? Have we mm. done this? Of course we have, and we do this in numerous ways. In fact, a couple of years ago, when I was leading the effort to scope RHEL 7, I was shocked to find that lots of customers told us, my approach to security is I have a lock on the door and I have a firewall and I'm good. And I couldn't quite believe it back then, <laughs> and I'm sure that doesn't work anymore. So certainly having these barriers for external access helps, but is not complete. Now what about if there are threats that affect us that are actually not really external threats because they happen within, like for example a security issue that suddenly affects our system so our applications can no longer be considered healthy and well-being? Well, you know, we should identify them and then try to isolate them. Like this? You know, yeah, but put a watchdog in place, it looks good. Like, put them off to the side, someone in charge, you know, responsible for keeping them aside. So we put somebody in charge who finds yeah. the bad stuff and does something about it? Yeah, that, that sounds it. good, yeah. We should call it the security team, how is that? Yeah, works. Cool, all right. Of course, now that security team, in order to do its job, <laughs> how do they know what they're dealing with? <sighs> Looks like a sheep. Almost. Yeah, no, so I think you, you need some deeper introspection. I think you need to look into the things you're running and understand the components and you know, find out what is what, right? Yeah, so we need to establish trust. We need to establish who we trust and what we trust, and we need a technical way to do this. Yeah. It shouldn't be just we look at and, it, and it and looks who good, not, we who, like who it. Who not to trust, right? Yeah, who not to trust, not obviously. this guy. Yes, right? not this guy. All right, so we, we work on trust. Now, of course, we don't only have a few applications. We have lots of applications in lots of different environments, and we, run, we might run into scalability issues with that security team, because we only have one of them, and we probably want to consolidate the power about this. So how can we scale that? We, we divide and conquer, right? We put them into their own little area and separate them, separate the concerns, so things that belong together run together, and we look at them in a bigger group. What about yeah. diversity in that? Is it harder for us when they are very diverse? Yeah, or is it easier well, you need to okay. standardize, right? Like if everything, everything is the same, that's good. So you know what you have. If you have to like track all these different versions, different variants, that, you know, no one can do that. No one can keep up with that. Okay. So standardize, golden image, be done with it. Yeah. Right. We call that standard operating environment. And I see Dirk in the audience. He's done a lot of work in that. You want to talk to him about it later. Anyone in the room have a standard operating environment for operating systems? That's when you raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> all right. OK. So that Can we get a pen over the, like, the camera over the audience? I think they all raised their hand. <laughs> so that approach has served as well. We've standardized deployments. We've standardized components and used them at a high degree uh, of consistency across very different environments. And I think that was OK. It was okay until we started doing this. If we want to doing, if we want to enable agility, we have to empower people to make their own decisions. And the first thing they do when they make their own decisions is they make different decisions. They is no longer a, make the same decisions. Are this unicorn sheep? Yeah, this is the uh, this is the application that's going to make us all rich. Uh. You heard of that? <laughs> We talked about this one too. Yeah, ago. yeah, no, I, I, I know the team that built it. They're creative. They're creative. So, so as you see on this picture, suddenly we face diversity. It's no longer the same. So standardization is no longer the right tool to manage the scale. And at the same time, we empowered people to make decisions. Now they are responsible for the security. Can we trust the security team on the left of that picture to be very effective in their role? What do we have they, to do They look to make good when, when they show up in the news. Yeah, we don't want them to show up oh, in the news. Well, I think we have to teach some people how to be responsible and give them some tools. And like, I, I think with a centralistic approach, you can't do this anymore. It's right. like, everything is different now. So, we so to maybe generalize this, it's not about turning developers into security experts. It's not about making them accept all the rules of security, but we have to make them part of the system. There's no way around it. 
We cannot have agility and at the same time rely on a separate entity managing the security for all these decisions, for scale yeah. issues, for timing issues. Which is, which is true beyond security, right? If you rely, if you're in agile DevOps model and you rely on an external quality team that is somewhere else and not embedded in your process, how good is the outcome gonna be? And is it gonna be agile? Right. So let's say we figure that out by building the right systems, the right tools, the right processes. Now we face the next challenge. We not only empower people to make decisions, we enable them to make decisions at a much faster pace. In this case, we replaced sheep with pronghorns, which is the fastest animal in North America, in case you didn't know that. I certainly didn't. Now at this fast pace of change, again, the traditional methods of controlling change might no longer work because we just have too many events that we have to manage from too many entities that in itself are diverse again. So yeah. how do we solve that, Daniel? It's the, the model of like doing a hot fix like once a month, a patch day doesn't work here. So the only way you can keep up with this is if you automate the hell out of it. CICD is the buzzword here. We need to not only change the culture, we need to provide tooling that gives us continuous integration, continuous deployment, and that means continuous security. And this would be security by DevOps, where we leverage continuous delivery pipelines not only to deliver features and deliver a rapid pace of change, in the sake of in support of agility, we use these same techniques, the same processes, the same tools, and the same organizational methods to achieve and manage security. And that is what we have to get to. Unfortunately, it doesn't stop here. I mentioned this earlier. We now have a system that can carry a lot of change at a rapid pace of change, but now we're decomposing our applications into microservices. And suddenly we again increase by an order of magnitude the number of subjects Daniel, how can we manage that? It just means you need a machine, right? This is beyond human scale. You, know? you can't just watch things manually anymore. At this point, we need to automate even the analytics of the system. We need to identify issues automatically, and the machine needs to take decision decisions. All right. So I hope you got the idea of what we mean with complexity, and you got also an idea of where we're going with this next. So when we think about managing security in this world in which we strive for agility, we have to do this differently. It's no longer about raising fences and putting a dog in place. It is about having continuous delivery and getting to an analytics world. And if we look at this a bit strategically, then we have to get to a world that more looks like what we describe on the left side. We have to be able to be proactive about security anticipate issues and being able to respond very fast in a methodical way as well as in a getting early notice that something might be wrong. In order to do this, we have to move decisions about security upstream to where the change originates. And that means largely developer teams, but it also means suppliers from which we consume technologies because typically we don't write all the code ourselves inside the organization. We're consuming from ISVs, from communities, from service providers. We have to rely on machines in a way we have not before. There is a psychological barrier of trusting a machine making better decisions than humans, even though when the machine is well instructed, it probably does make better decisions because it is objective and it's also objectively faster. And we have to start driving analytics. Now that we're early in this, in using security or analytics for managing security inside the enterprise, there's a pretty robust ecosystem outside of that when we think about threat management or denial of service prevention, but we have to bring these same technologies into the enterprise so we can actually start to see the risks inside uh, the larger complexity that we are managing in, in the enterprise and focus attention to where the attention should be and not just try to boil the ocean with managing everything. So Daniel, how could we possibly do this inside an enterprise environment? So I think we have to redesign the approach to IT. We have to design it to be secure. We have to have security by default. It's the only way we're gonna get there. So to talk about how we do this, from our point of view, it comes down to the four elements on the right side of this. There is a trust is a very important component. We saw the wolf earlier. We have to know what can we trust and who can we trust. And we'll see on the next slide, in this highly dynamic world in which things change very quickly, they come and go, and there's lots of people making decisions, trust is not something that we can anticipate to last very long. Trust is a very short-lived thing, it's dynamic. And we'll talk about how to do this. We talked about automation. 
we have to have way more automation across the entire system than we ever had in order to be able to act on risks that we've identified. And we need to consume and produce, actually, a lot of insights about what's going on inside a system, about the components, about the changes, about the users making changes, and about the impact changes make uh, on applications and infrastructure, and use analytics across all these insights to bubble up what do we want to act on. So the architecture to manage security in this dynamic world of cloud, DevOps, and microservices has to have these attributes. And we think of this as a new platform that defines the operational model for the enterprise that is able to respond to the needs of both the application users that we want to hold accountable and to some extent, to a larger extent, make responsible, as well as the operator, which we don't want to be in the middle of all the changes anymore. The, ch the machine should make the changes. But the operator is responsible for overseeing it and help and trigger and help making decisions. So most of the work will happen inside that platform. And uh, as you see, we use the sheepdog here with the example. We need to see what's going on. We need to be able to make sense of it in an analytical sense. We need to be able to act on it in the form of automation. And we need to be able to visualize and report uh, to the operators what's going on and what they should pay attention to. That is the platform we need to build. At the same time, that platform needs to run across very different environments. As Paul said this morning, from bare metal to virtualization to private to public cloud. So do we have that platform today? Anyone? Yes? No? Who thinks we have that platform today? One, two, three? All right. This guy's right. <laughs> You're too. Daniel, why so you take let's it? take a look at um, containers. Right? Containers change the operational model. You know, um, they provide abstraction from the underlying system, right? They separate, they isolate um, the runtime of a specific service from the runtime of the underlying host or other services, right? Aggregate packaging. They provide control points, they're lightweight, they provide inspection, and they're really nice for automation. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. There are a bunch of different use cases that are relevant here, right? You can, you can basically containerize every application that runs on Linux. Uh, it comes down to doing the right mount points and giving the right privileges. At its core, you can reduce a container to just be a change root on steroids, which loses some of the isolation factors, but still gives you the ability to always isolate the binary dependencies and you know, give you something that you can automate easily. Um, there are traditional stateful and pet containers that you will see. They're loosely orchestrated container applications that you just you know, cobble together. And then there's the fully orchestrated multi-container applications that really um, lend themselves best for automation and um, you know, looking at, at a microservices environment. So on the surface, containers have all the right attributes of what we need to manage the security. Now we need to do th two things. We have to figure out how do these containers fit into the larger enterprise picture and the total stack and total solution. And how do we actually arrange the technology so we can trust containers to do all these things in a secure way? So let's look at this. Let's look at a stack view. So if you look at the, at the application-centric stack, how we look at that from a Reddit point of view, it's pretty simple. There are three layers, infrastructure, the application platform, and then application content. They're usually dealt with by different groups. You map that to persona that handle it. IT ops, traditional sysops manage the infrastructure. The application operations team runs the platform, and the developers obviously are in charge of writing applications, doing the applications. Um, application, op op <coughs> application operations sometimes is part of infrastructure in a traditional model, sometimes part of development in a more DevOps model. But sometimes, and we see more of that, they have separate, they have separate team that supports development independent of the underlying infrastructure. Yeah, that's an important point. We're not just describing a technology architecture. We're also describing a, mo a model or a possible model for building organizational structure and arranging responsibility in that inside the organization around it. So let's double click into each of these layers and look at what are the capabilities that each of these layers delivers and what do we need, what do we need in order to do this securely. So let's start with the infrastructure. The infrastructure in the end of the day is the core, it's the bottom, it's the foundation. And its primary role is to provide us the commodities that we talked about earlier. It's about compute, network storage, but it's also about infrastructure level services that are horizontal in nature and we need available to all our applications, to all our environments. 
And we can implement these capabilities as physical or virtual infrastructure in the data center, as a private cloud or as a public cloud. We have all these choices. And it's only logical to build a layer of abstraction on top of that infrastructure. What do we expect from this layer when it comes to security? So the most important piece, first of all, is that your infrastructure itself needs to be secure. Right? If you have insecure code running your infrastructure, you won't have security. You want isolation, which means you know, the ability to carve out a specific area of the network, the storage, and compute, put it together, and treat it as a unit without you know, being protected from other parts of the system, right? your private network in the cloud. Um, you want tenancy. You know, so the ability to control that with different entities. And you, of course, want physical security because your servers stand out on the street, then you won't have much security. Yeah. So as you can see, this is not where we make applications secure. But if we fail here, then everything else will fail too. So at a minimum, we have to make that layer secure. And from a Red Hat point of view, we've invested a lot of work over the years in making that layer very secure from SA Linux to KVM to Linux and all the value you consume and you are familiar with. So let's shift to the next part, the application platform. This is really the container management platform that we talked about this morning, Paul talked about this morning quite a bit in the keynote. So it provides the capabilities that we need to uh, consume these services from the underlying infrastructure but now make them available to applications in a distributed computing model in which we have abstraction to the underlying infrastructure, but in which we also have the orchestration that allows us to place applications uh, on different parts of the environment, connects these resources to the applications in a secure way, fitting into tenancy, uh, fitting into uh, security context. And this is also where we orchestrate workflows. This is where we apply policy about making changes, about making placement decisions, and also we make decisions about access. This is where we grant access to applications, to resources, for example, storage. Paul talked about container native storage this morning for stateful applications. The orchestration engine is the one that grants access to a container, to an underlying storage volume, but not another container, to that same volume. And this is also where we drive uh, the content distribution mechanism so the container fabric, the container management platform, is not only the brain of the operation, it is also where a lot of the changes happen. So it's therefore very, very important. And consequently, the list of security attributes is equally long. Yeah. And of course, it starts again with the platform itself needs to be secure. And you want build and deployment automations, and you can react, right? That's what gives you the ability to react and recover. Um, in the case of security issue. You want policy control points so you can enforce control and a content trust model so you can actually, your policy can have some base to, to make decisions on. You want this ability to scan and introspect, look at this you know, weird sheep with the dog tail and find out what's going on there, what's inside. Um, you want a delegation to enable autonomy you want application privilege model to decide what application can actually do what. You want exter external access mapping so you can control which services are reachable from where. Right? You need that, and, and then you need um, orchestration back into the infrastructure providers to enable that. Right? You want your, your platform to be able to tell your cloud infrastructure how to connect to things. So you don't end up with overlay on overlay on overlay on overlay that at the end has so much complexity that you lose the ability to introspect. And you want management and you want an inventory so you know what you have. Sounds easy, doesn't it? <laughs> the good news is that was the easy part because that's the part that we can do horizontal as a compute fabric serving many different applications and many different users. Where the real complexity lies is here. Because that's, as we saw in our little example, that's where a lot of complexity will be in what technologies are deployed, when do they change, how do they change, who makes the decisions, how well informed are these decisions, and therefore, how can we manage it? So when we look into the content, and in a containerized world, what we talk about here are the technologies that go into these containers, that live inside container images and running container instances, and typically we find multiple kinds of content. It starts with the operating system runtimes and language support and frameworks inside these containers, goes into uh, the uh, modules and frameworks that the developer used um, basically to increase his productivity, which typically he gets from somewhere, 
and they might come from the operating system, often they don't. Um, and then there's the actual custom code, which might or might not be securely written in itself. And in some instances also, you would deploy packaged services as a whole, which now give you a security attributes around the service as a whole. So we look at the complexity here, and how do we manage that from a secure point, from security point of view? So the first most important thing here is you need trusted content sources, right? If you pull in content, you have no trust and you don't know where it's coming from, you won't have much security in that content, or you need to do a lot of work to secure it yourself. You need content metadata, again, for the policy to act on, and you need security labels that tell you what the trust levels are and what, what the needs are for the code, on the other hand. OK. So now back to the question. We asked earlier, do we have that technology? And here's the answer. We do. We ship it today. We sell it today. You can buy it today. You can deploy it today. We call it OpenShift Container Platform. And it really is at the core of the operation, because OpenShift delivers and implements all these capabilities inside the container paradigm. So let's go through a number of use cases, relatively brief, because we'll run out of time. Um, so let's go through this. Let's start with the trust element. Here's an interesting data point from, from Redmong, and we've seen similar data points from other people, that many enterprises don't actually know what technologies are deployed. They think they do, as you see in this picture. Decision makers think they know what's used. But there's a reality of what's used. And that might still not be the same that people want. Now consider what I said earlier. We want to empower people to make their own choices. So we will see these three circles get further apart. So we obviously have to do something about it, because we cannot manage issues that we don't see. So how do we do that? So first of all, you know, we look at two different ecosystems here. One ecosystem is for package container services, so things you just download and run, or you build your own applications on. So it's a base images and like a database messaging service, things that you, you get as a container in the OCI format. The second is developer content, which is component level, right? So this is your RPMs, NPMs, Maven Central files, you know, all that kind of stuff that your developer uses to build their own application. So the most important thing, and I talked about that earlier, is like you need to trust the content. So you, you ingest the content from trusted sources, and you will ingest some unknown sources. Then you validate it. You use the uh, signatures metadata available, and you use additional tools like, for example, Black Duck to qualify the data, run it through governance, apply policy, apply your manu manual checkpoints, uh, run into content management to manage the availability in your, uh, in your organization, and then you iterate over that because you know, security trust is temporal. Right? You keep going, you keep going in this. So proactive ingestion management is what you do for both containers and component level content to have a secure starting point. And another important point here is to validate stuff. Of course, we want to trust technology, we want to trust sources, we want to trust users, but we all know trust is great, but trust but verify is slightly better. So scanning is all about being able to verify. And when we think about scanning, there is a mechanical piece to scanning, which is actually fairly trivial. That's not hard. The real value of a scan is in what insights can it produce. Therefore, we have launched, in fact, this week on the uh, atomic scanning interface with, through which we enable an ecosystem of solutions where lots of companies and people can bring their insights that then we can find issues or risks inside real-world deployment. So we believe this is very, very important to manage that complexity. And we hope we end up with something that's better than the prior incarnation of scanning that we're all very familiar with, which was the antivirus scanning reality. So we hope we come out with something better than that. Um, important note is we offer um, not only our own content uh, with trust attributes, we do have a container certification program in which we manage uh, certified third-party containers. And that's important because you will not be able to assess the risk that's inherently in ISV services and solutions you get from somebody, so you need to trust them or a third party like Red Hat uh, who attests that we have tested these. Uh, or we know, who, we know who did it, I mean, yeah. that's where it starts, right? Um, so, very important, and that was early in the strategy, it's very important to move security upstream. This is really the core of the engine. Um, in the new model, what you would do is you give the developer a tool to develop with trusted content, 
they probably will always pull in some unknown sources unless you have very tight controls. Most companies don't have tight enough controls to prevent developers from pulling in some unknown sources from somewhere else. And you tie that with a build system that becomes a control point where you scan, you validate, you have your CI flow um, right tied to the development process and you audit the ingress, you, audit, you do early detection. From there you go to content management, this is where you apply policy, assess risk, um, classify the risk and answer the who, what and where questions. Then you go to the promotion engine with the different um, uh, uh, targets based on the, on the uh, classification you do, which could be staging, could be production, and you cycle over that. And you constantly assess the, the risk, either in staging or production, wherever, constantly assess the risk based on what changed, any kind of change, either in your available metadata or in the code or any, any additional information you have. And then you recommend an action to back to the policy, the policy takes care of that, and it cycles back to build. So, uh, with containers, containers enable this model where the machine executes a policy so you get to full au automation. And the good news is you don't have to build these flows. We did. We built it into OpenShift. And in OpenShift today, we can automate the building of code and the deployment of code changes responding to any change. We can respond to changes that emerge in the actual source code of the application as well as changes that emerge in the underlying runtimes on which we build our code as well as configuration or even manual changes about tweaking, tuning, or uh, whatever it might be a developer want to change. Whatever change gets made has to go through that pipeline and can go through that pipeline, which is why we can now move the power upstream to the application owner because everything from, out from there downstream happens in a predictable, managed, automated fashion. And so at the, at the end, this is continuous integration deployment we're talking about, which is the only way you can keep containers secure. But containers also are the only technology that really enable continuous deployment and continuous integration at enterprise scale. So this comes together and enables you to apply this new uh, <coughs> security um, strategy. All right. So, you know, important point is that policy must be innate. So there needs to be self-service for the developer, and the self-service needs to implement the policy. You need to have multiple delivery paths that automatically get chosen, chosen based on machine decisions, like staging versus production. You need, um, you, you need full automation because the operation only scales if, op if the operation of an application is independent of any manual um, interjection, unless you have an exception situation. You know, at the end, where we need to be is that operating your, your own software that you deploy in-house becomes basically as easy as using a SaaS offering somewhere else. It's the only way you can scale. And of course, you need to have resource controls, policy control and resource controls to manage that. Um, example, quick example on the scanning um, that is pluggable. This is uh, the, the Red Hat scanning interface that uh, Lars mentioned earlier, where we have Black Duck as a partner and our own OpenSCAP compliance tool that manages our own uh, security information. Black Duck gives you for non Red Hat software uh, developer content security information, and that's tied into this platform. And consider you probably want to tap into multiple of these data sources just to shed some light on it. ASCAP manages effectively errata and CVEs that we deliver in the open operating system and middleware components. Black Duck, on the other hand, can make, can produce insights and assessment across the entire universe of open source code. So even technologies that you might not even know are used by your developers, Black Duck can recognize them and can give you an assessment. So a good strategy is to think about multiple of these data sets should play a role in assessing the risk of what's used in the content. Yeah. And then one of the reasons why the platform needs to be extensible. Here's an example, a quick example on SCAP report and um, a policy interface, how you can have a policy react to um, a report. Like for example, block an image from actually being run. Right? So this doesn't scan or it's incompliant, it cannot be run or even I migrate off, I trigger rebuild and then uh, automatically redeploy the fixed image. This policy was used this morning in the Borosados demo where he showed how there was a container that couldn't be started because it didn't pass the test. You might remember that. So why does this, you know, how is this different? Why do containers matter? And I want to step back and look a little bit at the history. You know, the pre-container build workflow 
um, which I mean, often is already DevOps, DevOps v1. What you would do is you have your developer develop based on known and unknown content. And you usually use the test QE as the one checkpoint where you run your scans, you validate that things do what they do, and then you move things into production. And then you iterate about that. So test is the um, checkpoint. Um, and this is a continuous cycle of redeployment. What happens is development builds something, and then it gets um, reassembled in test from a recipe on the component level. Then you deploy the stack into production again from a recipe. Then you apply common uh, bug fix update in place, and then you apply a security fix in place. And each component on the stack, like your core runtime, your EAP, your Java application, moves through this process independently as their own components um, on the RPM or JAR level. And that, the problem with that, it, it ends you in an eternal spiral of change, right? So development does something, hand it over to test, and some dependency in a module might have changed. So what you test is not exactly the same as what you develop. Then you put it into production, there might be some subtle change in uh, the behavior of an underlying library. So what you run in production might not exactly behave like what you tested. So you put it in production and you update things in place. Um, so there might be an IBI breakage after a bug fix, or you know, a security um, update maybe doesn't apply cleanly because there is a change in dependency, a dependency conflict, two things conflict. Right? The problem with this, it's a late binding approach. And late binding stacks are changed in place and break in production. That's a huge problem. That doesn't scale. That's, that's going to kill the, the DevOps model in your production environment. And this is not a result of us doing something right or wrong. It's math. It's probabilities. The more pieces you have, the faster they change, and the more often they change, the higher likely is you yeah. face that risk. In this model, you, once you're done patching at one end of your cluster, with, you know, in one of your three million services, you'll start over again. You're constantly patching in production. And you never know exactly what you're running across the board. What we said earlier, you need to standardize golden images. Everything's the same. That's gone. We can't keep everything the same just on the timeline. It's impossible to do that. And you know, what this ends up being a black hole for your operations. Now, I got this from NASA. I have no idea how a black hole looks. I, I trust NASA with this. <laughs> so containers make a difference, because containers in, introduce aggregate packaging. Containers move through the development test production cycle as a single entity for the whole stack of that service. So we have the exact same behavior. The behavior we have in one place, we can absolutely reproduce 100% in another environment. And that's one of the core values that containers give us here, because we aggregate all these different yeah. components, and we therefore have a snapshot. One, one other historic thing, like early in, in Unix and Linux, we compiled things in user local on each machine when we had few servers. The problem is what that was that the behavior of your application depended on the state of the machine when you compiled. The current complexity of this change gets us back to even a bigger problem. Right? The behavior of your system depends now on the state of the cluster at the point in time where you apply an update. Yeah. And that's not doable in scale. And that's also what's wrong with virtual machines. Right? We hear the question a lot, how are containers different than virtual machines? And the number one difference is actually not about container host versus hypervisors or efficiency or utilization. The number one difference is a container image is stripped down to a single purpose, serve the application that lives in there. A virtual machine, on the other hand, cannot be stripped down. It combines a lot of different pieces, the guest operating system, application code, runtimes, configuration, tuning, security agents, all these things. And as you see on this slide, in most organizations, these pieces come from different groups and change at different points in time. So a virtual machine is always exposed to that complexity issue in a way that containers are not. And that's one reason why containers are the better technology to manage the application lifecycle securely than virtual machines. Yeah. While at the same time, we happily run container hosts inside virtual machines and then containerized applications right. on top. And it, yeah. So on top of that, what, what you need is a management environment. And you know, with Cloud Forms, Red Hat Inside, we provide this, the aggregation of scanning data, policy control, and ongoing assessment. 
So you can be notified of issues, you can manage your manual interjection, your escalation, and you can control the policy set, the platform policies, and report on metadata and metrics, and, um, and then run analytics against it. And this is just a sample screenshot to show you know, how, how you can visualize the dependencies of a service. Then you can click into each of them and see what's going on. Yeah, we saw some of that also this morning in the demo uh, in the Cloud Suite, where we got a CloudForms component, uh, where we can double click into the application domain, into the environment, into the service, all the way down to the security information that, we, that CloudForms knows about that service as a result of scanning and as a result of applying policy. So that is a way how we use technology to aggregate data and produce insights. This is a healthy state look, so nothing is alerting here. It's just for our information. Similarly, we can also drive policies that actually trigger alerts or trigger automatic, uh, automatic recovery activities. Right. So what's all this about? In the end, the conclusion is that the conclusion that we have reached Red Hat is as we think about strategies for managing security, we have to openly embrace the changes because they are driven by business needs. They're not optional. And we find that building on containerization as the paradigm and building on the capabilities that containerization brings with abstraction enabling autonomy, with standardization enabling automation, with, uh, standard, with uh, the uh, standardization also enabling insights and analytics, it is the right technology to build that next generation platform for managing security in the enterprise. And it actually passes all the tests that we showed on the left side and implements that. Yeah. We wanted to leave you with that.